the Stewart Observatory here on the University of Arizona campus, heartiest greetings of joy in Jesus Christ. Heartiest greetings of joy in Jesus Christ. Happy New Year and Happy Epiphany. Welcome to Desert Skies, a joyful community drawing people to Christ as a multi-site ministry, one, uh, one church, two campuses, and online. I'm Reverend Susan. And I'm Reverend Candace. And if you're worshiping with us for the first time, you'll notice that we aren't in our sanctuary. We're trying some new things for a new year, but we're so glad that you joined with us for worship this morning. Uh, we do have some online features. There's a place for a connection card up at the top bar of your screen. If you would fill out information, we'll get you all the information you might need so that you might know more about the Desert Skies Faith community. There's a place there for you to chat on the right of your screen if you want to interact with people um, during the worship service. And uh, we just hope that you find a delightful worship experience uh, online with us today. We invite you now to take a deep breath as we enter into this time of worship, a time of discovery of the newness of a new year in the spirit of Epiphany where we stretch ourselves to look at the world in new ways and with new eyes. Open my eyes that I may see glimpses of truth thou hast for me. Place in my hands the wonderful key That shall unclasp and set me free Silently now I wait for thee Ready, my God, thy will to see Open my eyes, illumine me Spirit Divine. All of us grow up with biases. It's part of our identity, our family, our culture, our way of thinking. So we will spend Epiphany exploring ways of recognizing, transforming, and transcending those biases so that we can open our eyes to new ways of seeing. Today, we look at how two of those biases are at play in the experience of the wise men with King Herod. It could be a wild ride, so take one more deep breath and get ready to wait for God. my God, thy will to see. Open my eyes, illumine me. Spirit divine. Arise, shine, for your light has come. The glory of the Lord has risen upon you. The glory of God shines in the darkness. Lift up your eyes and look around. Follow the star wherever it leads. Take the journey that leads to the child. Let your hearts rejoice. Be overwhelmed with joy. We worship the Christ child, the hope of the world. of Orient are, bearing gifts we traverse afar, field and fountain more, and mountain following yonder star. Oh, star of wonder, star of light, star with 
with royal beauty bright, westward leading, still proceeding, guide us to thy perfect light. Quietly, the new year slips in. Are we now more fearful? The radio asks. More careful? More tired? Are we now more aware of the suffering, the violence, the inequality, the injustice in our world? Holy God, in this new year, we seek you as we have always sought you. We need you as we have always needed you. We hunger for your presence, your peace, your justice, and your love. Open our hearts afresh and anew. Open our minds that we may know you. Open our hands that we may care for you. Open our ears and eyes that we may hear and see you in our neighbor, in the foreigner, in the refugee, even in our enemy, and perhaps especially in ourselves that we may know in the deepest part of ourselves that you call us and that we are capable of seeing and naming, doing and being your love, your peace, your hope, and your justice in this world. Amen. My heart beats like a drum Wind up with the sun I grab your hand again Renovated with life My eyes again bright You are radiant Where hope can hold the hand of sorrow We can walk into tomorrow where peace is found in troubled days And the joy of Jesus carries pain This is a new year And this is a new day To rise, shine, lift up your eyes This is a new year And this is a new day To rise, shine, point the way to God's great light I'm held in a place, a beautiful space Where heaven meets the earth My heart opens wide, and the Father pours life Deep inside my soul Where hope can hold the hand of sorrow We can walk into tomorrow where peace is found in troubled days And the joy of Jesus carries pain This is a new year And this is a new day To rise, shine, lift up your eyes This is a new year And this is a new day To rise, shine, and point the way to God's great life Where hope can hold the hand of sorrow We can walk into tomorrow This is a new year and This is a new day To rise, shine, lift up your eyes This is a new year and This is a new day To rise, shine, point the way to God's great life This is a new year this is a new day, rise, rise, rise and shine. This is a new year, 
this is a new year. Rise, shine, point the way to God's great life. Well, welcome, children. We're here in a really special place today, the Stewart Observatory on the University of Arizona campus. And inside this building is a giant telescope that's about a hundred years old. It's been aimed out into space, helping people see planets and stars better for a really long time. Now telescopes, they use big mirrors and lenses to help us see into outer space and to appreciate and learn the beauty and wonder of it. Lenses? Did you say lenses? Mm -hmm. Well, I have lenses in my glasses. They help me see things around me, but they don't help me see in the sky very well. Well, lots of us have glasses, and you're right. They do have lenses that are helped to make you see ordinary things a whole lot better. But the people who use telescopes to study the stars and planets and solar systems, they're called astronomers. They use big, giant mirrors and lenses to see things that are very, very far away. But you know what? Neither the lenses of glasses nor great big telescopes can help us see better if we don't use them. If we don't actually look through them and try to see what's really there. Ah, I see what you mean. If, if I didn't put my glasses on, I couldn't see very much at all. I, I'd probably do things like bump into other people and maybe hurt them. And I, I couldn't see all of the beautiful flowers and things very well. So just because I decided I didn't need my glasses and didn't use them wouldn't help me very much. No. So our scripture story today tells us about some, pe some people who want to see and one person who doesn't want to see. And it causes trouble for everyone when one of them chooses not to see. That story begins in the book of uh, the Gospel of Matthew and it begins long ago before telescopes were ever invented. It was when Jesus was born in Israel and there were some really smart people from a far away country who studied the stars and the planets. And one night they noticed a star that was really bright that they hadn't seen ever before, but they knew about it because they had heard stories about this star. And that story was that when it did appear in the sky, it would mean that there was a new king of the Jewish people that had been born. Wow, I bet they would have liked to have a telescope like it's in there to help make that star appear bigger and closer so that they could see it close enough to study it. Uh, well, but that's not what they wanted to do. They didn't need to study it. They wanted to follow it because they knew if they could follow it and they could travel there and see this wonderful new thing that had happened in this new baby for themselves. But they had to see it to follow it, right? Right. So when they saw that star, we read in the story that they got up right away and then they kept their eye on it, walking at night where they eventually found Jesus and his family. That's right. So. Being that Jesus is kind of like having glasses that help you to see clearly and with love, just like God sees us. And those are the lenses that we want to look through every day. So doing things like reading your Bible, taking time to pray, talking with your parents about the stories of Jesus, joining in on our special children's Zooms and being kind to one another. Those are all ways we can put on our spiritual glasses. And when you wear your glasses, then you can see just how much 
um, you, more you can see when you truly follow Jesus. Amen. Amen. I think I'd like to share a prayer with you right now, boys and girls. Let's pray. Loving God, help us to see like Jesus. Help us to be kind like Jesus every day, all day. Amen. Amen. Hear these words from the Gospel of Matthew, chapter 2, verses 1 through 12. After Jesus was born in Bethlehem, in the territory of Judea, during the rule of King Herod, Magi came from the east to Jerusalem. They asked, Where is the newborn king of the Jews? We've seen his star in the east, and we've come to honor him. When King Herod heard this, he was troubled, and everyone in Jerusalem was troubled with him. He gathered all the chief priests and the legal experts and asked them where the Christ was to be born. They said, in Bethlehem of Judea, for this is what the prophet wrote, You, Bethlehem, land of Judah, by no means are you least among the rulers of Judah, because from you will come one who governs, who will shepherd my people Israel. Then Herod secretly called for the Magi and found out from them the time when the star had first appeared. He sent them to Bethlehem, saying, Go and search carefully for the child. When you found him, report to me, so that I too may go and honor him. When they heard the king, they went. And look, the star they had seen in the east went ahead of them until it stood over the place where the child was. When they saw the star, they were filled with joy. They entered the house and saw the child with Mary, his mother. Falling to their knees, they honored him. Then they opened their treasure chests and presented him with gifts of gold, frankincense, and myrrh. Because they were warned in a dream not to return to Herod, they went back to their own country by another route. Hear what the Spirit is saying to the church. We open our hearts to God. Two years ago, next month, Mark and I attended the specially called General Conference of the United Methodist Church in St. Louis, Missouri, which was specifically dealing with inclusivity and the impasse our denomination has been experiencing for years around sexuality. It seemed from the very outset that people had dug in their heels and they really weren't there to learn anything to try to see things from any other point of view than their own. Signs were made, booths were up, pamphlets were being distributed. Now, there were some attempts to simply show love and compassion, which were appreciated. But pretty much everything we saw from the time we arrived to the time we left was designed to convince people to see things in a particular way. One afternoon, Mark and I were walking down a street near the convention center where the picketers were fairly dense. We were with several of the clergy women from our annual conference when suddenly one of the picketers shouted out something like, go back to the kitchen where you belong. The Bible says women can't be pastors. Quit living in sin and do what God wants. Wow, quit living in sin. Do what God wants. I, I think there were a few other expletives thrown in there, but I do remember being shaken to my core, feeling both attacked and vilified for simply doing and being what God made me to be. And perhaps I understood in a new and visceral way 
a tiny bit of what my LGBTQIA plus brothers and sisters experience every single day of their lives. And yes, even in church. And I began to really wonder how people can see things so differently, reading the same scriptures, living with the same laws, trying to follow the same Savior. So when my youngest daughter, Katie, shared a podcast series with me this summer called Learning How to See, I was intrigued. With all the polarization in our country, not just over sexuality in our church, was it really possible to open ourselves up to really learning how to see and understand someone else's point of view? Well, I believe it is. So I'm really excited to share what I've learned from that study, from my own thoughts and prayers, as it relates to the season of Epiphany, which is all about seeing things in new ways as followers of Jesus. And the basic premise of what we'll be looking at this year is simply this. People can't see what they can't see. That's right. People can't see what they can't see. Acknowledging that, we will look together for the next few weeks at the biases that every single one of us have that prevent us from seeing. There, are, there will be 13 in all, and Brian McLaren, who wrote the original um, ebook that the podcast series is based on, has identified them all with C words, which help us to remember and compare. Now, we all have all 13 of them. So this just isn't, just isn't about the biases that that other person out there has. This is about every single one of us. So we start this series with confirmation bias and complexity bias, which show up in our scriptural encounter with the Magi, otherwise known as the wise men, and King Herod. Confirmation bias is where we judge new ideas based on the ease with which they fit with and confirm the only standard we have. Old ideas, old information, and trusted authorities. As a result, our story, our belief system, our paradigm excludes whatever doesn't fit. A modern-day parable illustrates this beautifully. Uh, there was a couple, Joe and Ethel, who were in their mid-80s when Ethel became really concerned that Joe was losing his hearing. Ethel knew that Joe didn't believe in going to doctors and would not make an appointment, so Ethel went to the doctor herself to address her concerns. The doctor suggested to Ethel that she return home and speak to Joe at successive distances to determine just how serious the hearing problem was. After you get an idea of how serious it is, come back and we'll figure out what to do next, said the doctor. So when Ethel got home, she knew that Joe, Joe was tinkering in his workshop at the other end of the house. So she called out, Joe, what do you want for dinner? She listened, but there was no reply. Walking into the living room and closer to Joe's workshop, she yelled, Joe, honey, what do you want for dinner? Still no reply. Ethel did this two or three more times, each time moving a little bit closer to where Joe was working. Finally, standing just behind Joe at the doorway of his workshop, Ethel asked in a loud voice, what would you like for dinner? Joe turned to her and looking quite annoyed said, five times I've told you, chicken! Confirmation bias tells us that we first see those things that confirm our beliefs. 
we have this frame for living that things tend to fit into very nicely. When they fit, we sigh with relief. When they don't, it feels like hard work to make them fit, so we tend to reject them. That feels so right, reasonable, comfortable. Now, along with being biased against that which doesn't confirm what we already think, we also have a built-in bias towards simple concepts or explanations, even if they're inaccurate or incomplete. The second bias is complexity bias, where our brains prefer a simple falsehood to a complex truth. So if you've ever thought things like, but it's so obvious, or even a child can see that, or, but the Bible is so clear, well, you're experiencing complexity bias. Because friends, things are almost always more complex than they appear on the surface which is why we have so many disagreements about things in our lives. So in our scripture story today, we have the Magi traveling from the east in search of the fulfillment of an astrological prophecy, believing that they would find the newborn king of the Jews. So they travel far, following a star, asking questions of the people that they thought would help find him so they could honor him. Their confirmation and complexity biases would tell them that they would find like-minded people also searching for this newborn king. So where do they go? They head straight for King Herod, because it would be pretty natural to assume that the baby was born to his royal family, so it was a logical and simple place to start. But they were wrong in their assumptions, and they had to find another way to find the king and honor him with their gifts of gold, frankincense, and myrrh. In fact, They eventually had to go home a different way because along the way they were warned in a dream that Herod meant them harm. Keeping an open mind then protected them and the baby and allowed them to maneuver through their own biases. On the other hand, King Herod, who is the current king of the Jews, sees this newborn baby as a threat to his power, to his kingdom, even if it is only a puppet kingdom put in place by the Romans. So his confirmation and complexity biases caused him to put in place a plot to discover what the Magi know, planning to use both that information to protect himself and to get rid of this obvious imposter would-be newborn baby king. Now, most of us would put ourselves solidly in the Magi camp, believing ourselves to be open to new ideas, willing to travel far, ask all the right questions of all the right people, be receptive to other perspectives, kings, as it were, in other places, and honor that which we find. Because that feels comfortable and right to ourselves and our own perceptions. But if we're honest with ourselves, most of us can point to times when we judged, labeled, or projected our own biases onto others' ideas, and even times when we become defensive, when our own expertise or assumptions are challenged. Neil Postman, an educator and writer, once said, our children enter school as question marks and leave as periods. Following up on that rather disturbing comment, Larry Dressler, in his book Standing in the Fire, writes, 
when we can stand with a truly open mind, we become question marks again. So to sort of figure out where you are, ask yourself, have you ever had any of these thoughts? I know what he or she is thinking. I know what's best for the group. I know what you mean. I know what that group's options are. I know exactly where this is going. I know this will never work. You get the point. Our certainty that our point of view is right sneaks up on us all the time. And that is our confirmation bias at work. Dressler tells the story of one of his first consulting assignments of his career. He was sent to New York to facilitate an organizational restructuring process for a long-haul trucking company. He was, as most of us would be, rather nervous and was studiously running through his presentation in the back of his cab on his way to see his client. Unfortunately, he had a chatty cab driver. About his own age, the driver was African-American, dressed in a sweatshirt and a torn wool cap. What do you do for a living? The cab driver asked. Annoyed, Dressler replied curtly, consulting. The cab driver asked, what kind of consulting? Another terse reply, it's called organizational development. Ah, the cabbie answered, you're an OD consultant. Wondering for a brief moment how he even knew that term, Dressler returned to his notes and his preparation. But no luck. The cabbie pressed even further. So what kind of project are you working on here in New York? With the utmost patience and probably a rather patronizing air, the words came out, I'm helping a company reorganize. And the cabbie replied almost instantaneously, ah, so you're probably drawing on some of the insights of Galbraith and Minsberg. Is your client considering a matrix structure? Dressler looked up from his notes and saw the cabbie grinning in his rear view mirror. He closed his notebook, smiled and said, okay, who on earth are you, and why are you driving a cab? Well, it turned out that the cabbie had a master's in organizational studies from Yale, worked for a while in a firm that had actually turned Dressler himself down, but decided that that life was not for him. So he bought a small fleet of taxis and got behind the wheel every now and then to learn more about customer needs. For the rest of the taxi ride, they talked shop, and Dressler is convinced that the conversation that ensued allowed him to have success with his client later that day. You know, when we forget that there are teachers all around us, that different worldviews exist, that can open our eyes and hearts to new perspectives, that the gift of seeing from another's perspective, especially if it's unanticipated or even downright uncomfortable, can make our life journey much more meaningful. Then we sell ourselves short, and it becomes impossible for us to follow those stars that are placed in our lives and impossible to experience the miracles that are all around us. And how do we stand with an open heart and an open mind? Well, first, we have to be willing to admit that there are indeed some places in our lives that our certainty is misplaced. We really don't know. We need to create spaces 
that allow contradictions to coexist, learning to live with a little bit of discomfort and uncertainty, and then hold in tension the varieties of opinions and solutions that are actually available to us. And you know that you're starting to have an open mind when you notice yourself becoming curious about ideas that initially repel you. And that's especially true when someone you respect, admire, even love holds a different point of view from your own. Because then you find yourself wanting to understand Most of the time, simply because you don't want to feel the way you're feeling about that particular person with whom you are vociferously disagreeing. So through this series, we're going to work together on learning how to see, even taking some of the events of the past year and seeing how we can see them, learn from them, talk about them with real 2020 hindsight. We will cultivate four principles proposed by Larry Dressler, embodying humility, suspending judgment, expressing curiosity, and holding possibility. And if we do, I believe that we and any church that does this can be a relevant voice in the ongoing conversations of our time drawing people into a greater understanding of what Jesus is telling us about living in a God-soaked, loving one another kind of life. What an epiphany this will be. Amen. By the light of the star, God led travelers to the Christ child. When they saw the child, they were overwhelmed with joy. By the light of divine love, God leads us to this holy meal. Gathered together, we encounter the living Christ and taste the deepest joy. Breath of God Breath of peace, breath of love, breath of life, breath of justice, breath of passion, breath creating, breath of healing, breath of singing, breath of huddle in the shadowed corners of life rather than running to the light of life? Why do we love the wrong we do rather than grasping the good news offered to us? As we struggle with such questions, let us speak to God of all we have failed to do, seeking hope and grace as we pray together. We search for For your your light, light, Starcaster, but too often end up settling for the dimness of temptation. Our motives for seeking to find Christ are not always pure, for we expect him to fulfill our desires rather than your hopes for us. We want the gifts of wealth, health, success, fulfillment, rather than those of servanthood, of of compassion, and of peace. Forgive Forgive us, shaper of our lives, that that we we are so foolish to put our needs ahead of your your grace. Help us to be like those wise people of so long ago who found hope instead of a destination, who found grace instead of gratitude, who found salvation instead of a sign, 
as we journey with your Son, our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. Fill us with the light of your joy and love. Up on your feet, grace has been poured into our hearts. Love has flooded our souls. The light of hope shines in us. This is the light which has come to all, the light we will carry and give to everyone we meet. Thanks be to God. Amen. Come upon us. Come restore us, come inspire us, breath of God. The Lord be with you. And also with you. Lift up your hearts. We lift them up to the Lord. Let us give thanks to the Lord our God. It is right to give our thanks and praise. It is right and a good and joyful thing always and everywhere to give thanks to you, Almighty God, creator of heaven and earth. Before the mountains were brought forth or you had formed the earth from everlasting to everlasting, you alone are God. You created light out of the darkness and brought forth life on the earth. You formed us in your image and breathed into us the breath of life. When we turned away and our love failed, your love remained steadfast. You delivered us from captivity, made covenant to be our sovereign God, and spoke to us through your prophets. And so with your people on earth and the company of heaven, we praise your name and join their unending hymn. Holy, holy, holy Lord, God of power and might, heaven and earth are full of your glory. Hosanna in the highest. Blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord. Hosanna in the highest. Holy are you, and blessed is your Son, Jesus Christ, in whom you have revealed yourself, our light and our salvation. You sent a star to guide wise men to where the Christ was born, and in your signs and witnesses in every age and through all the world, you have led your people from far places to his light. By the baptism of his suffering, death, and resurrection, you gave birth to your church, delivered us from slavery to sin and death, and made with us a new covenant by water and the Spirit. On the night in which he gave himself up for us, he took the bread. He gave thanks to you. He broke the bread and gave it to his disciples and said, Take, eat, this is my body which is given for you. Do this in remembrance of me. And when the supper was over, he took the cup, gave thanks to you, and gave it to his disciples and said, Drink from this, all of you. This is my blood of the new covenant, poured out for you and for many for the forgiveness of sins. Do this as often as you drink it in remembrance of me. And so, in remembrance of these, your mighty acts in Jesus Christ, we offer ourselves in praise and thanksgiving as a holy and living sacrifice in union with Christ's offering for us as we proclaim the mystery of faith. Christ, Christ has died. died. Christ, Christ is risen. Christ will come again. Pour out your Holy Spirit on all of us gathered here and on these gifts of bread and cup. Make them be for us the body and blood of Christ that we may be for the world the body of Christ redeemed by his blood. By your Spirit, make us one with Christ, one with each other, and one in ministry to all the world until Christ comes in final victory and we feast at his heavenly banquet. 
through your Son, Jesus Christ, with the Holy Spirit in your holy church, all honor and glory is yours, Almighty God, now and forever. Amen. Amen. And now, with the confidence of children of God, we pray together the prayer Jesus taught us to pray, saying, Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen. The bread that we break is a sharing in the body of Christ. If you have created a communion feast for yourselves at home, we invite you to take a piece of your bread and share it together with your family. The cup over which we give thanks is a sharing in Christ's blood. And as you share with one another, you too are sharing in all that Jesus has for all of us. For those of you who prefer to come to the church and to take communion as a family in our drive through communion, you will be handed when you get there um, one of our um, safe communion elements where you've got the bread on the one side, you'll be handed it, you can peel back the bread and partake of the bread that way and turn it over and partake of the cup as we share together in communion. That will be offered following the 10 o'clock service, so at 11 o'clock at the Houghton campus, and following the 11.15 service, so at 12.15 at Micah Mountain High School. And we hope that you experience communion in a way that's meaningful for you as we continue to shelter in place and are prohibited from meeting together as a physical community, but knowing that we are still the spiritual body of Christ. We gather to offer thanks to God for all God has given us by sharing generously of ourselves and of our resources. Through our gifts, we hope to meet God as we open our eyes to see in ways we have never seen before. We ask that you prepare your offering check and put it in the envelope and mail it to the church at 3255 North Houghton Road, Tucson, Arizona, 85749, or go online to www desertskiesumc.org and click on the donate button.
We'd like to thank you for your generous Christmas offering and support of Africa University. Uh, we truly appreciate it. You appreciate that, and we know that the students we support appreciate it as well. Thank you. Lord God, the bright splendor whom the nations seek, may we who with the wise men have been drawn by your light discern the glory of your presence in your incarnate Son, who suffered, died, and was buried, and who is alive and reigns with you and the Holy Spirit now and forever. Amen. of Christ be with you and also with you. Will you make a gesture of, of extending your cupped hand toward those who are with you or near you as a sign of the peace of Christ that is given to all of us? And if you're alone, will you cup your hands over your heart as a sign that you extend your heartfelt peace into the world? And now, go in the knowledge that God is holding your life, even as God is opening your eyes, so that you might truly see one another as God sees you. You are not alone. You are loved. Amen. Amen. Shalom to you.